you can. Um, wanna um, wanna take us to a fella who kind of had a, had a tremendous ministry, but kind of missed the mark. Um, his name's Elijah. God had a few things he had to say to Elijah uh, when Elijah was up on the mountain with God, and I'm going to read it to you in just a moment, but he repeatedly asked Elijah this question, uh, what are you doing here? And so this morning I want to start with that question, what, uh, what are you doing here? And uh, we'll be taking a look at the life of Elijah, uh, that 19th chapter. I've got them all up here, by the way, so the uh, it's up there. I don't know, it might interfere with, uh, with that, but um, anyhow, what are, what are you doing here? Um, there's a key verse, before I read in, in the 19th chapter, there's a key verse, and, and it'll go up, Adam, go ahead and, put, and stick it up there. In that 18th chapter, you kind of need to know this because it begins to help this the whole thing make sense. Um, Elijah's there. He's on the mountain. He's in front of the prophets of Baal. They've had their turn. It's now Elijah's turn. Elijah has had them dig a, a, a pit around his offering. He's had them pour water on it three times. And now he's about to call upon God. And if you remember, it was a big, uh, it was a, a big competition about who is really God. And um, the, the prophets of Baal had cut themselves, and they, they were trying to call upon Baal to come and burn up the offering. Um, when they got done, Elijah had, like I said, dug a pit, had them dig, dig a pit, poured water over it three times, and now he's about to pray. And here's the way the prayer goes, and we're going to see that God answers it. He says, answer me, Lord, answer me, so that this people may know that you, Lord, are God, and that you are turning this is, this is crucial. You are turning back their hearts. Right then the Lord's fire fell and consumed the burnt offering, the wood, the stones, the dust, and even the water that was in the trench. When all people saw this, that what had happened, they fell flat on their faces and they cried out, The Lord is God. The Lord is God. But Elijah said, arrest the prophets of Baal, don't let even one of them get away. And so the people seized them, and Elijah brought them down to Wadi Kishon and executed them there. Now I want to take a peek at, Elijah, at, at the ministry of Elijah. We find Elijah then, having gone from there, um, enters into the political arena, if you will. The king and the queen decide they want to jump in. They're not entirely happy. Uh, happy with him uh, and what he has done to to their religious nation, nation's religious leaders, and uh, Jezebel particularly is irate. Uh, Ahab is moaning and groaning, and his wife takes action and sends uh, a message to Elijah. I want to just read these eighteen verses to you, okay? So you have the the story, and then we're gonna we're gonna talk about it a little bit. In verse, starting with chapter 19, verse 1, it says, Ahab complained to, Je to Jezebel about everything that Elijah had done, especially the part about him killing all the prophets of Baal with a sword. And Jezebel sent a messenger to tell Elijah, May the gods do the same to me, and even more, if tomorrow about this time I haven't made you like one of those prophets you had killed. Now get this, Elijah was terrified. And so he got up and ran for his life to Beersheba, which is a part of, the, of Judah, and uh, left his servant there. And he ran for a day's journey deep into the wilderness. He found a juniper tree, sat down under it, and prayed that he could die. And he asked God, Enough, Lord, take my life, because I am not better than my ancestors. And then he lay down, he went to sleep under the juniper tree, and all of a sudden there was an angel who kept grabbing him and telling him, get up, eat. And so he looked around, and there near his head was a muffin sitting at, on the top of some heated stones along with a jar of water. Elijah ate and drank, and then he lay down again. And later the angel of the Lord came a second time, grabbed him, said, get up, eat. The journey ahead of you is too difficult for you. And so Elijah got up, he ate, and he drank, and he, he survived on that one meal 
for 40 days and nights, and he set out on his journey to Horeb, God's mountain. Now, I would share it with you that I did a little bit of research, and I didn't spend a lot of time on it, but uh, I did, you know, that 40 days that just kind of rang some bells for me. You know, ding, 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 yeah. Jesus was in the wilderness 40 days, and um, I would suggest to you to study it, read it for yourself. I'm not, yeah, don't, don't look at me with a frown. I'm not going to give you all the secrets, dear. Go home and do your homework. And uh, check it out, what, what happened to Jesus, 40 days and 40 nights. If you remember Noah, that kind of rings some bells with me there, 40 days, 40 nights. Now Elijah, 40 days, 40 night journey. And uh, headed to Horeb, God's mountain. By the way, it is the same place, um, Mount Sinai, where, uh, where Moses saw God, got the Ten Commandments. Okay? Let me read the next eight verses. The Lord speaks to Elijah. Elijah arrived at the cave and stayed there. And all of a sudden, this message came from the Lord. What are you doing here, Elijah? I've been very zealous for the Lord God of the heaven, heavenly armies, he replied. Let me, let me just stop there. It just now occurred to me that... He, Elijah was terrified of Jezebel, and yet how does he address him here? The God who's got what? Heavenly what? Armies. Just saying. What are you doing here, Elijah? I've been very zealous for the Lord God of the heavenly armies, he replied. The Israelites, the Israelis have abandoned your covenant, demolished your altars, executed your prophets with the swords, and I, that's right, just me and the only one left. Now they're seeking my life to get rid of me. Go out, he responded, and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord. And there was the Lord's passing, and there was the Lord's passing by. A tremendous, mighty windstorm was tearing at the mountain and breaking the rocks in pieces in the presence of the Lord, but the Lord was not in the windstorm. And after the wind, there came an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was a sound of a gentle whisper. And as soon as Elijah heard it, he covered his face in his mantle. He went outside and he stood at the entrance of the cave. And there a voice spoke to him and said, here we go again. What are you doing here, Elijah? I've been very zealous for the Lord God of the heavenly armies, he replied. Probably thinking to himself, do you have a hearing problem? He said, uh, the, Israel the Israelis have abandoned your covenant, demolished your altars, Executed your prophets with swords, and I, that's right, just me, am the only one left. Now they're seeking my life to get rid of me. Almost sounds like he had been rehearsing this, doesn't it? And so the Lord replied to him, go. Return to Damascus, and when you get there, anoint Hazael as king over Aram, anoint Nimshi, son of Jehu, as king over Israel. Anoint Shaphat, as son of Elisha, from Abel, Mahola, as a prophet to replace you. And whoever escapes from Hazel, sword, Jehu will execute. And whoever escapes from Jehu, sword, Elisha will put to death. Nevertheless, 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 by the way, that's not, the emphasis is not there. I'm emphasizing it. I've reserved 7,000 in Israel who have neither bowed their, their knees to Baal nor kissed him. Father, just read your word. It's precious. It's truth. It's real. It shows us in the light of who we are. 
it shows us in your light who you are is there to help us this morning Lord I'm praying that you will speak in ways that only you can through your word as I make a few points father without your Holy Spirit no one here can walk away um, better than they came and so Lord I know that it's on you as I do my best for your glory for your honor in Christ's name amen I would share with you that, that um, in chapter 18, and I read it on purpose, and I know that was a lot of reading, that uh, Elijah's prayer indicated his, uh, his intrinsic understanding of God's desire and uh, God's mission, that not Elijah, <clears throat> but that God would turn the hearts of the people to God. I would remind you that the church isn't built by us, but the church is built by Christ. And he said that to Peter. He said, upon this rock, I shall build my church. Based again with Peter on some truths. And um, I, am, I am confident that God is not done here. Uh, you just take a look around. Why, why go through all this trouble to re remodel and to update our, our building. And by the way, I was just talking this morning to David. He said, these, these chairs are very comfortable, okay? But it doesn't give you permission to go to sleep. Just saying, all right? But uh, they are comfortable. Um, I had one of our neighbors in this week past, and uh, I brought her in. She was out and walking her dog. And I said, well, come on in, um, the likes. Um, and uh, I brought Doreen in and said, come see what's happening in the church. And she said, well, what happened to your office? And I said, well, we gave it to the people <laughs> for the glory of God. And, uh, but anyhow, she, she looked at the chairs and I said, these are way comfortable. And she said, I got to try these. And came in and sat down on your chairs and said, yeah, these are nice. <laughs> these are nice. But God is up to something here. And, and I know and I am confident that God will build his church what I want to do today is remind you, but I want us to take a look at Elijah, and I want us to learn, because I need us to understand that God is in cooperation with Elijah, and he's in cooperation with you and I, and that we can make a, ch we can make a change in the makeup of eternity, and that we can make a change in Rochester, and that we can make a change. And notice I'm not saying I, but we. This is a together thing, and I'm going to show you that through what took place here with Elijah. There is a, it, it's, it's extremely significant that, that God had said to Elijah not once but twice. Elijah's response didn't change either, but God wasn't buying it. Um, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? So let's take a look at Elijah. Let's take a look at Elijah's problem. Go ahead and throw that up there. Um, the first thing that I would share with you that I, I understand is that Elijah's self-talk was a big part of the problem. Elijah, Elijah said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of the heavenly armies. He replied, the Israel, Israelis have abandoned your covenant. By the way, uh, that was a half truth. That wasn't totally true. They've abandoned your covenant, demolished your altars, ex ex executed your prophets. By the way, he... he um, you know, he thinks that uh, they're all gone. They have executed your prophets with the swords, and I, that's right, just me, am the only one left. Now they're seeking my life to get rid of me. Let me back up here for a moment. When we're talking about the prophets, I'm not talking about the prophets of Baal, but I'm talking about the prophets that were gods, that, um, that were hidden in caves in, uh, uh, because Ahab and Jezebel had set out a decree to kill all of God's preachers, all of God's prophets. And so... Um, what, but what's really true is, is that they, several of them, many of them, hundreds of them, had been hidden in caves and protected and fed and taken care of. But that's not Elijah's self-talk. Elijah is convinced that all of the prophets are gone, and he says his self-talk, I'm the only one. Well, it's me. It's, it's just me. Uh, I'm all by myself. 
Now, I can relate to Elijah because quite often as I'm working here in the church, um, and I'm not saying this to feel guilty, I'm just saying this to to tell you that when we get into self-talk, it's really critical. And I go home and I tell my wife, I don't want to focus on, you know, that I'm working so often by myself. The truth is is I need to have a good attitude, I need to have a right spirit, and I need to know that we're doing this for Jesus Christ and for his glory. I am grateful, I was sharing with Judy just this week, that I've had a couple weeks when I've had just more help than I really needed. Um, Well, let me back up. I had more help than I could stand. Um, It seemed to me that um, the week of the board meeting, um, Terry would come in and help during the day, so I would work all day. I'd go home, get something to eat, and uh, Tim would come in, and he would say, Pastor, I can help, and I can do this and this and this, and I'll be here this day, this day, and this day. And so I would work in the morning, go home and eat, and then I had to come back, and I would work till 10, um, 10.30 at night, and uh, I'd get up in the morning, you know, knowing, and I was really grateful that Terry uh, often said that, you know, Pastor, how about 1 o'clock? And I'm like, oh, thank you, Lord. So, see, even when I get help, it's <laughs> self-talk. You understand? Elijah's full of self-talk. And what he's telling himself is, um, is I'm the only one. Oh, huh. And the people, they're, they're just rotten. He makes enemies out of, out of God's people. You know, they, they killed your, your prophets. They're, they're, they're just, you know, I've, I've been zealous, but they, they haven't. They've abandoned your word that sound familiar? They've abandoned your word. They've demolished your altars. They executed your prophets. There's no preachers. There's no altars. There's, there's, there's nothing. And that's right. Just me. Just me. I'm the only one. I'm zealous, but I'm the only one. Now they want to get rid of me. Two other instances biblically that come to mind where self-talk plays in, none of them are good. Um, They, uh, you know, and we need to understand this, that self-talk, and we all do that, by the way. We all talk to ourselves. We are all talking to ourselves all the time. Right now, you're, don't look at me that way, dear. Uh Oh, it's the glare. I'll polish my forehead next time. Jesus finds Martha. Martha is an interesting character. Martha has some self-talk, and she has convinced herself that Jesus doesn't care um, when she's there making a meal and Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus with everybody else listening, and she said to Jesus, don't you care? And she got there. How did she get there? But by her self-talk. And when you read about Jesus visiting, the scriptures actually say when he visited earlier on in the Gospel of John, it says that, um, well, let me just read it. Um, Luke, Luke says this, but the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you're anxious and troubled about many things, but only one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which is not to be taken from her. And then in John eleven five, it says this, now Jesus loved, I love this, Jesus loved Martha and her sister. Didn't even mention Mary by name, or at least John didn't. And Lazarus. And so Jesus responds to Mary. He said, Mary, or to, to Martha, is Martha, you know, he didn't say it, but your self talk stinks. Your conclusions. Uh. There's another instance in the Old Testament. I'll share this with you and then I'll move on about self talk. The 10 spies that went in to, to, to spy out uh, Israel, Moses had sent them in to check out the land. You know, I think Moses was thinking they'd come back with the best plan to go in and take her, okay? And take over, because God had promised it. I, I don't think Moses was prepared for what came back to him, but the report came back with everybody except for two, Joshua and Caleb, and they, this is what they said there in Numbers 13.33, um, those uh, other eight spies said, and there we saw the Nephilim, In parentheses, the son of Anak, they were giants, by the way, David and Goliath's ancestors, um, who come from the Nephilim. And here's what they said. This is self-talk. We seem to ourselves like grasshoppers. And so we seemed as well to them. How did they get there? Did they holler up the wall and say, hey, you big giants, what do we look like, grasshoppers? No. They got there with their self-talk. There's, well, this just leads me to the next point. Go ahead and throw it up there. His self-talk then 
uh, led him to his assessment, which is colored by his self-talk. Elijah's uh, assessment of the, of the whole scenario is colored by what he keeps telling himself, what he keeps rehearsing in his mind, what he keeps playing over and over and over again in his head. That, that I, you know, everybody's abandoned. I'm the only one, and I've been so zealous, Lord, and I just, I just like to die and get this all done with. But his assessment is colored by his self-talk. As he makes the, the assessment of the world around him. And what has happened to him is he's lost sight in the midst of great ministry that God can and does the unbelievable. I mean, he just, how do you lose sight of the fact that, that he just cried out a prayer to God just a, just, just, just uh, a month and a half earlier. And, and God has come down and he has burned up the offering. He's burned up the altar. He I read it, he burned up all and dried up all the water in the in the in the, the ditch that was deep ditch that was all the way around. It says he burned up the sand. I mean, how do you be part of that and then and then lose sight of it? Well, you do that because of what you tell yourself over and over and over and over again. And by the way, this isn't anything new. Satan introduced it uh, to there in the garden with Adam and Eve, and he began to get them to doubt and then get their self-talk, and they start to check it out. They start to really think about it. They start, I'm sure, they're, they're just made like us. They start talking to themselves. But Elijah's perspective is, uh, is actually an interesting one. Uh, as he loses sight in the midst of great ministry that God can and does the un unbelievable, and his perspective then becomes that God was actually losing. How, how do you get there? But, but, Pastor, where did you read that? I, it, it isn't, it isn't what, what, that it spelled it out that way. It's what Elijah was saying. You know, all the prophets are gone. God, this thing has gone bad. This thing has gone sideways for us. It's gone sideways for you, and it's gone sideways for me. That's what he's saying, isn't it? I'm the only one left. And God's saying, what are you doing here? And so his perspective is that God was actually losing. I'm the only one. Alders are broken. Prophets are killed. The, if, 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 even if I went back, I, I know what he's thinking. It'd be so overwhelming. I mean, what, what can one guy do? And because of his assessment, then his ministry is affected by his assessment. Go ahead, Adam. You got it up there. There is a whole nation in the courts of Ahab, King Ahab and Jezebel, that will need some leadership. Elijah has just created, in essence, a leadership vacuum. And anytime you have a leadership vacuum, it's going to get filled up. And he says, I'm the only one, altars are broken. Um, he, he goes on, Elijah, as he, as he creates this leadership void, it will be filled by someone, and, and already Jezebel is trying to step into that vacuum. Leaders realize when there's a vacuum there, and they know they can step in. And the lack of leadership always, always draws the wrong kind of leadership quite often, and what we need is godly leadership. These people that have just given their hearts back to God, are in the courts looking to someone to help them. What do we do next? Uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's the same thing with congregations. But, but, Elijah, but Elijah had just been handed a whole congregation of people who cried out, we now believe the Lord God is the one true God. Who are ready, whose hearts are ready, who are open to be led by someone. And where's, where is God's man of the hour? Running off. They're going to need someone to help them figure out the road back to true worship, the road back to God. Now that they have confessed he is God, they have a lot of unlearning to do. And what I have learned is that it is a thousand times harder to unlearn something than it is to learn something new. It's just hard. And they've got, they're, they're in need of somebody. Hence, God keeps asking Elijah, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? 
Well, his ministry is affected by his assessment. His assessment is affected by his self-talk. His faith reflects his view of God and the people. What he's really saying is God is good, but people are bad. And so he wants only to hang with God. I would share with you that faith, um, true faith, uh, it's required in doing the mundane, regular work of the ministry. Most people who uh, come to church, they come to church for some kind of supernatural experience with God. That's that's what they come looking for. Um, God is actually, though, more interested in knowing if you'll be faithful with the minutia of ministry. Now, I was online, and I, I looked up on Google ministry. I thought it was interesting what uh, Google's definition in their dictionary of ministry is. I don't think, I don't believe is anywhere close to what God's definition of ministry is. Google told me, gave me two examples. Ministry has to do with either uh, a religious organization, or a religion, or B, Ministry has to do with a cabinet office in, in, in government. I'll tell you, ministry is about people. Serving God by serving people. That would be God's definition. How do you know that, Pastor? Because Jesus t- told me as, as much. If you want to become the greatest of these, you become the servant of all. You'll follow after me. He came, he died. His ministry was what? It was about people. Ministry is about people. Thus, God says to Elijah, Elijah, what are you doing here? But Elijah's like most people. He wants to experience God. I just want to come to church and and experience God. I want to have that mountaintop experience with God. I'll make a sacred journey to go experience God. I, 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 I just want to be with God. Lord, I just, he's singing the song, I just want to be where you are. Living daily in your presence. You know what God is saying to him? What are you doing here? What I find so encouraging is, is that God doesn't, you know, I mean, God, God wants us to be with him too. What are you doing here? He doesn't, he doesn't reject him. In fact, he takes care of him. He feeds him. He gets him ready. I just want to be where you are. And he makes the journey, that sacred journey. He's going to go have a spiritual retreat with God. Because God is good. People are bad. What are you doing here? Elijah? It actually, God didn't forbid him to, from the experience. He does, however, severely reprove Elijah for his self serving desire to be in yet another supernatural experience with God. It, deple- it displeases God, and, and he wants to know what are you doing here? Elijah? Two weeks ago, I was speaking with my oldest son, James, who does youth ministry. I was sharing with him how perplexed I am that the mega church, that so many mega churches seem to be predominantly young, and the old and young and the churches tend to be segregated, and about how the younger folks, um, at least the, the, those who've been in church, have come along and they want to come to to come to church and they, they want to have an experience. They, they like it when it's more like a concert. Nothing wrong with that uh, in itself. I, I remember going to church when I first started going to church where I got saved. There was a, a quartet. Uh, the pastor was a part of a quartet and the church grew because everybody wanted to come hear him sing. Nothing wrong with that. Unless and except when we just want to come from the experience. And so, as James had been doing youth ministry for 20 years, and I was sharing that with him, he, he began to chuckle at me. And uh, he didn't say, Dad, you, what a knucklehead. <laughs> he said, well, Dad, that just actually makes a lot of sense to me. 
And he began to explain. He said uh, in his own church, you know, and he talked about, he talked about doing, doing this ministry for 20 years with, with teenagers. And he said, uh, for 20 years now, we have been plugging teens into programs with pizza and great concerts and doing the big show of excellence. What do you think we're going to get when we place them in the adult arena of church? Hello? He said, and that's one of the problems is that too many churches wanted programs instead of discipleship ministry with teenagers. Big difference. He said, in our church right now, we're trying to find a way to desperately get church congregation to hook up with teenagers. Take them to lunch. Do something with them. Disciple them. Have a relationship. He said, but they go look good, looking for the next performance that moves them. And that seems to be actually Elijah's deal. He's all about the high drama moving of God. Oh, man, we can take out these prophets of Baal. We can call on God. We'll, we, we will get dramatic about it. We'll dig a ditch. We'll pour water on, not once, but twice, and then a third time. And then we're going to call on God. And God, in his, in his infinite love for the people, he calls on, and his prayer is dead on. Oh, God, show these people who, real, who the real God is and turn their hearts back to you. And God says, I can work with that. And so God partners with him. So Elijah is about the drama. The ostentatious work of God. Nothing wrong with it. But when we get to the mundane work and the real work and the people stuff and dealing and rubbing elbows with people who ought to know better but they don't, it's like, ah, I'd rather die than do that. Well, I've shared with you kind of his deal. I, I, I'd, like to, I'd like to just talk about how we need to see people the way God sees them. First of all, let me share with you that God's bigger than the boogeyman. How's that? Is that, that that's just theology, man? That's deep. God's bigger than the boogeyman. He's bigger than Jezebel and Ahab and Bugs Bunny. You know? But how fast Elijah was derailed. Second, God sees people. He has compassion for us, for our brokenness. And oh, how God wants our hearts. Here's the real question, though. What, what was it that motivated God to be so cooperative with Elijah? What, what, what was God's heart in all of this? His heart was to win the people. That's what moved God. That's how Elijah connected up and was, was used by God for the, the powerful, the supernatural. And that's why God was so willing to invest in Elijah's ministry. And so when Elijah's no longer interested in ministry, he's saying, Elijah, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? Yep, Elijah stepped out. He trusted and he had faith. Enough at least to face the prophets of Baal. And Asherah was in on it, by the way. But what really was on the mind of God was all those people who would be without a godly shepherd. And where do we find Elijah? He's up on the mountain looking for a deeper experience with God. And it was self-serving. And God is asking, Elijah, what are you doing here? Let me ask you a contemporary question. You know what contemporary is? We, we bring it to our own time. Why are you here? Or perhaps better put, what are we doing here? A couple years ago, God 
And I know it was from God because I'd never preached it before. It never even occurred to me until I was in this scenario. God had me share with you a concept that I had never thought about, that folks that walk through these doors are actually God's gift to us. Period. Honey, your gift. God sent you to us. He just wants you to know. You may feel like a visitor, but we think of you as family. Especially because you like my, Matthew, and we like Matthew. Right, John? You better say yes. It's your boy. What a concept. Not long ago, his mother and stepfather left him here in Rochester at the age of 17. You don't know this, but I do, because I counseled with him. He suffered abuse early in his life, and he showed up here for a while. He worked with cameras for us for a bit. And if you didn't catch the news this week, we had a bomb threat. It's right out there. If you take a look at our, at our sidewalk, I had sent notices to the board and cost us a lot to clean it up actually more than I cared to spend more than I felt we had to spend this week he made bomb threats at our church and another church in the school he was one of ours what has been going through my head all week did we do our best? Now, I, I'm not here to make you feel guilty. I've, I've thought a lot about this and, and debated whether I even wanted to share this because I know what Satan does with this kind of thing. Where I want to go with this is, is that we, from this point forward, make sure that we do everything within our means and within our power. That's where I'm going with it, to make sure that we know, without a doubt, that we've done everything we can. But he's not the first one to come here. There's been another guy who came. He was with us. And one thing that I can tell you is, is that when, when people come, they're looking for answers. They've got questions. And what really moves and changes people when they come in is to know that they are, oh, here's a concept, loved. And so I, I wondered, you know, um, with, with Kyle, Kyle Miller, if you're wondering who it was, I didn't know when we got the bomb threat and the police woke me up at, at uh, about 5.30 in the morning, said, you need to come down, you need to get the graffiti off the sidewalk, and it's got to go, and rightfully so, because they wanted it to go away, because it said, bomb, if you look out there, you can actually make it out, bomb, call 911 now. And uh, my understanding, because when I, when I got the call, I said, uh, is it safe? Are the police there? No, they're gone. Dogs have been there. Um, I didn't know at the time, I didn't know at the time that it was our own Kyle. Um, I do know this, that I was, I was praying for whoever it was. I talked to Jackie, I think, and a couple board members. I think it was Betty. I didn't talk to all the board, got answering machines for, for most of the board, but, but you guys needed to know what was going on, and I needed to get it cleaned up. And um, at the time, I assumed that it was some dumb young teenager Really, and I remember saying this to Jackie. I might have said it to Betty too, thinking that uh, uh, this is really bad because if if they had just painted swear words instead of the word bomb, they wouldn't be doing prison time in a federal penitentiary. But whoever did this is going to do prison time, just by the nature of it. Later on that day, in, uh, when the news reporter showed up, um, I discovered, and then my wife called me because she had seen it. In his, there is a police blotter if you want to get on. Uh, I've tried to email them. I probably will make a call um, just to find out what I can do to help this young man, if there is anything I can do to help this young man. Um, and really who I want to talk to is his attorney. And you might be thinking, well, Pastor, why would you do that? Everyone needs forgiveness. All of us. Are broken. Some more than others. And those of us who aren't quite broken as much should be throwing out lifelines to help the rest to the safety boat 
you know, the ark of safety. Jesus. Amen. And I don't know how you process that. You may think, well, you know, he deserves what he gets. And I'm thinking, no. I'm glad God doesn't give me what I deserve. We're the church. And there are people coming into our midst, looking for answers. I know that I, um, with both of these young men that wound up <laughs> on the wrong side of the law, I have personally gotten involved in their lives as much as I could and as much as they let me. That lets me off the hook. Okay? I can't speak for my church. I don't know. And I'm not pointing fingers. All I'm saying is what I do know as, as a leader, just like God is saying to me, what are you doing here, Carl? As a leader, I want to make sure that from this point forward that anybody comes in here, they understand that we're all about them. Can I get an amen? We'll do whatever it takes. I mean, how tough is it to make a phone call? Hey, how you doing? Are you okay? You know what the hardest part about ministry for me is? Is I can't fix a thing for any of you. I can't change a thing for any of you. The only person I can change is me. And so I, I listen to what goes on, and you know, and my heart breaks, you know, in some scenarios, my heart breaks, and I want to fix. It's, it's, it's no different than my wife. My wife said, I feel terrible this morning, and, and uh, you know, don't, don't, don't frown at me. And she did. She, she said, I just feel, I feel terrible. And I said, I wish I could fix you. I can't. I prayed for her. She knew I cared. That's what people want. I don't know that the outcome would have been any different for Kyle. I, I just know that I just know that that you know he's going to deal with his mistakes. I don't know my God was asking Elijah what he was doing there off on a spiritual retreat with God, not because God didn't want to spend time with Elijah. He was repeatedly asking Elijah this because God had just the place and had just placed a nation of people into Elijah's hands. And Elijah was off convincing himself that he was was what he really needed was some personal time with God. He was telling himself that the ministry wasn't all that critical because it wasn't going all that well anyhow. And wasn't certainly going the way he thought it should be. Yeah, Jezebel and powerful people were making life hard for him. But the last time he checked, God had his back. God's got our back. Amen? And the last time I checked, God's word informed me that we are more than conquerors. And we are champions, actually. I know this. God wants to know what are we doing here. He loves people more than anything. God loves people more than anything. People coming through our doors are the very people God has placed into our very capable hands to minister to, to disciple, to get involved with. So what do we do with all this? God, help me with my thinking, please. All my self-talk and how I talk to myself. God, help me to stop seeing my world from my standpoint and start seeing it from the eyes of Jesus. God, help me to remember that ministry isn't about religion, but it's about people. God, please increase my faith. Adam, go ahead and throw that last frame up there, bud. Two questions. God wants, what are you doing here? Your reply. Your will be done on earth. <laughs> Just like it is in heaven. Amen. You're here with me. If you'll close your eyes. God.